Oh, thanks. We're, uh, I'm in the unfortunate position of standing between you and happy hour. Uh, and that's kind of like being uh, in front of a buffalo stampede. I don't want to be here long. So I'm going to uh, cut some of my remarks back. And I'd like to do something after such a brilliant conversation. Uh, th there's so much to be said. I can't summarize it. But let me say a few things I think that capsulize what I think is important about the conversation. Number one, the, the title of the State of the World Report, I think, has it right. This is an issue of governance. And if you had to pick where we went wrong, for whatever reason or reasons, uh, it had a lot to do with politics and governance. Number two, I think uh, I just reread on the way down here uh, Gordon Wood's book, The Radicalism of the American Revolution. And I think we need something like that, but now at a global scale, and we need it very quickly. But if you think of the political institutions that were invented or created, between, let's say, 1775 as an arbitrary date and 1820. Political power, uh, parties, uh, caucuses, the electoral system, a constitution. We need that kind of creativity now applied to uh, this. But now there's another issue. We need to think of governance as something that extends over uh, centuries or thousands of years. And I'll explain that point in just a moment. And then finally, getting to the uh, uh, I think where I want to get to in, in this talk, at the end of his uh, career, Lewis Mumford, who was one of the great intellects of the 20th century, uh, in a two-volume uh, uh, book uh, called The Pentagon of Power, Mumford wrote at the very end of it, and this was the despair of an elderly man of incredible brilliance. He said the only real response he had to offer was simply a steady withdrawal of power. And I think that's what uh, has been hinted at here a number of times. I think that's what the transition town movement's about. I think that's what the sustainable cities movement's about, the 2030 districts movement's about, and the Oberlin project uh, as well. Let me say a couple things, and I am going to be quick. Here's what we know, and I want to just capsulize this. Number one, we know that carbon dioxide went over 402 parts per million this year, this spring. It's never been that high before. And you can run that number or those numbers back probably at least 800,000 years, probably millions of years before uh, CO2 went uh, above 280 or 290 parts per million. Number two, we know that we're loading carbon dioxide in the atmosphere faster than ever recorded in the geologic record. It isn't just the volume, it's the pace at which we're changing it. Number three, we know that there is a roughly 30-year uh, lag between what comes out of our tailpipes and smokestacks and the climate change-driven weather effects that we see. And that lag will shrink as oceans warm further and further acidify. Uh, we know that the uh, first warning to a U.S. president was given in 1965. The first uh, research on climate, the effects of carbon in the atmosphere goes back to 1898. But we still have no de jure climate policy except pedal to the metal. We know that time's running out. Uh, a friend of mine uh, has proposed uh, a program around the world that we want. Uh, that world was a long time ago. Think of this going down an interstate highway. We passed the exit ramps to the world we wanted. Now we're going to be lucky to have a world that is in some way desirable. That's the thing hanging over us. And then I think most difficult, we know that carbon dioxide, once in the atmosphere, stays there a long time. It weathers out very slowly. And so Americans are really good about solvable problems. You've got a busted uh, uh, carburetor on a Chevy pickup truck, which happens frequently, I understand. Uh, that's fixable. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is not fixable in the same way. So the word solutions has to be taken with an asterisk beside that. Once carbon is in the atmosphere, it will stay there for hundreds to thousands of years. And there's some debate about what, uh, what that number is. But uh, David Archer, uh, climate uh, physicist, says that a quarter of the carbon I released flying down here this morning will be in the atmosphere 10,000 years from now. One quarter, 10,000 years from now. Now, if he's off by you know, an order of magnitude, maybe it's only 500 years, but that poses a civilizational crisis for which we have no precedent. And now that word governance on the title, of the, uh, the title page of uh, State of the World, now we have to think of governance over periods of time for which we have no experience. And so what has persisted in, in human history over that length of time, you think of the Chinese Empire or maybe the Catholic Church or whatever, but now we have to think <coughs> of a longevity in the management of public affairs that, uh, for which we have no precedent. Barbara King Solver puts it this way. 
The truth is so horrific. We are marching ourselves to the maw of our own destruction. And you can find comments like that. Betsy Colbert has said much of the same thing in, in, uh, in her writing. But uh, let me go on. Here's where governance comes in. We've wandered into a situation, but we didn't have to be here. This was a governance failure in every sense of the word. Our plight was largely avoidable. Lester Brown, had we acted on World Watch reports 30 or 40 years ago, we would have avoided the worst of what we now face. We would not have had 9-11. I mentioned earlier the Global 2000 report in 1980. Had we acted on that, instead of the fantasy that it's morning in America again, we would have avoided the worst of what we now face. We paid very little attention to the dangers ahead, rather like Nicole Krauss and her uh, book, The History of Love. There were rumors of unfathomable things, and because we could not fathom them, we did not believe them until it was too late, and we had no choice. She's describing Polish villagers in 1939. We've known that solar power for many years and efficiency would have carried the brunt of American energy consumption, even with continued growth. But we know that the causes also lie in an economy that is miscalibrated to the reality, biophysical realities. And we've known this for quite some time. Herman Daly's uh, wonderful work, and before him, his mentor, Nicholas Georgescu Rogan, described this in great detail and authoritatively, that we created an economy that defied the rules and laws of thermodynamics. We built an economy around consumption, most of it uh, fairly irrelevant. Uh, the amount of uh, we have to reconcile two curves. One is the fact that happiness, according to Richard Esterlin and other people who study happiness, peaked in this country around 1957, we're told. For me, it was a little later, but it was 1957 on average. So happiness comes up here in plateaus, more or less, and it bumps along here. But then the amount of stuff that we have continues to rise like this. And the problem is it's one of those forehead slapping moments. You know, We know this. We know that beyond a fairly minimal level of consumption, and income. What makes us happy is poetry, friendships, baseball, you know, you know, book groups. It's what we do together. It's how it's the bonds that tie us together. It's not bowling alone, Robert Putnam's phrase. So we know that uh, uh, the economy has uh, been calibrated, miscalibrated to the way that the world works. But it's it's a weird situation because somebody said the other day that, uh, or at least I read the other day that it's easier for us to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism, as we now can see. <laughs> yeah, go figure. And yet we've, we've had the panel, previous panel here, and, and uh, your work, and Gar's work, and so forth. I mean, it's brilliant stuff on how we, this, this isn't necessarily rocket science. Um, and a long list of things that we know we have to do. Remove money from politics. I mean, kick the coke habit, so to speak. Uh, lessen inequality. 400 people uh, are reported to have more net wealth than the bottom 150 or is it 185 million Americans. That can't continue. Democratize ownership, and we know uh, how to do that. And Gars pointed out that Ohio has, and, and the U.S. has lots of cooperative ownership and so forth. These aren't new things. The things that we have to take to scale, and time is not our friend here. We've got to improve civic education. We've got to improve the way we vote and the actual the management details of a democracy. We have in our, I'm part of a congressional district that is shaped so oddly and so weirdly that if you saw something like that growing under your kitchen <laughs> sink, you would call Orkin. Uh, but, but it's gerrymandered so that you got, uh, you, you know, the, this, there's only one person that can get elected. Uh, and the, the, the rules of gerrymandering are such that if you want to have a, you know, a district with all left-handed, blue-eyed, uh, Lithuanian people under five feet, six inches tall, you can do that. You can gerrymander that district. It's very, it's a science now. We know that we've got to reform uh, the way we represent ourselves in a democratic society. Montana has two senators. California has two senators. Montana the senators represent six people and, and four million cows. Uh, California senators represent 37 million Americans and almost no cows. Uh, we've got to take back public words for lots of reasons. We've got to take back the word. How did politics become a dirty word? How did governance become a word that was suspect? How did liberalism become a bad word? Why was it Mike Dukakis, remember that election where uh, he was accused by George Herbert Walker Bush of being a liberal and he backpedaled and there was this moment where you wanted Mike Dukakis to say, hey, yeah, I'm a liberal and I'm proud of it. 
and you are too, and here's what that word means. We needed somebody to do a political theory lesson with us and walk us through the assumptions that underlie our democracy. How was it that conservative became labeled with the most radical world-busting ideas? How is it that conservatives defend corporations that are heating the planet? Why is that conservative? We need to take back our public words and our public language. We need to extend rights to future generations. The history of rights is a process of gradual extension to uh, what had been barbarians to Greeks and to women and to Native Americans. And when Thomas Jefferson penned those words uh, about equality, all men are created equal. Well, it didn't take long before women figured out, hey, we're part of humankind too, and so that applies to us, and then slaves and so forth. But why not extend rights to future generations? My great-grandchildren have no rights, none whatsoever. Animals have no rights, and some are now suspected of being sentient in the way that we think we are. We've got to extend rights. We've got to protect the commons. We've got to see and take back the atmosphere, the oceans, genetic diversity. We've got to take back a lot that is now said to be private property of someone else or simply not allocated as property at all. And then we've got to come to this big thing right now, and I don't think it's nearly as hard as it appears uh, or will appear in hindsight. We've got to sequester, by one means or another, something like $20 trillion of fossil fuels. We can't burn them. Bill McKibben did the math brilliantly in the uh, Rolling Stone article, but we've got to figure out how to do that. And we have basically three choices. We can confiscate it, but we don't have the public will. That word governance has no muscle here. There's no teeth in that. But we could confiscate uh, fossil fuels. We could buy them out. We could compensate them. And $20 trillion is not an impossible sum of money amortized over enough time for a, a global economy to do that. Or we could render them simply useless. That's why the 410% the increase in solar power in this country over the past four years is such an important trend. We're starting small, but we've got to build. Uh, and then I want to mention this, and then I want to wrap up. The governance issue on the title is a big issue. Elaine Scarry, a uh, Harvard professor, uh, recently wrote a book called Thermonuclear Monarchy. How is it that we give a few people, a very few people, the right and capacity to blow up the planet? Shouldn't that be something we decide democratically? <laughs> but her point is, you couldn't do it democratically. So something has to go. It's either democracy or nuclear weapons. And I'm going to choose democracy. I think it's time that we abolish nuclear weapons. Uh, Robert McNamara and um, Henry Kissinger and a number of other people who faced those issues as policymakers arrived at the same conclusion. Nuclear weapons have to go. They cannot be used safely here. They cannot be used democratically. As long as you have them, they will be potentially used at some point. They pose that danger. But then by the same logic, how is it we give people, some people, a very few people, all of them mostly anonymous, the right to do synthetic biology? and to populate ecosystems with organisms for which we have no evolutionary experience. That is on about page 45 of the newspapers. We're not paying attention to that. How is it we give some people the power to create machines that may be, at some point, very soon, smarter than we are, and they'll find us inconvenient? And is this what we want? Do we want to pave the way for our own extinction? And remember, sustainability, that other word in the title. Uh, there are lots of ways to become unsustainable. One way that uh, World Watch is focused on is to destroy the planet. That's a pretty good way to do it. A second way is to blow the planet up. And the third way is to get ourselves evicted by creating machines for which we're not adapted, and they will not like us when they cross that threshold of sentience. And this is not a new issue. Uh, Norbert Wiener, one of the great uh, mathematical minds of uh, the 20th century, said in 1948, that when they cross that threshold, we have no reason to believe that they will be favorably disposed to us. Bill Joy, in a classic article in Wired Magazine in uh, April of 2000, said that we're already reaching that threshold. That was 14 years ago. He called for a moratorium on, such, on the making of such things. So, uh, James Madison, if only men were angels, no government would be necessary, but we are of all things, we're not angels. And so let me conclude with this. We need a revolution. And I think it's going to have to, for lots of reasons that have been discussed here, probably start from the bottom up. 
But this is all hands on deck time. We need everybody doing everything that they have been doing, only faster, more creatively, and more intensely. Uh, for me, and I want to give a plug to a magazine, several of us helped to start, and Gar has an article on this. This is the magazine Solutions. Now, unfortunately, Amory Lovins' newsletter comes out with Solutions. EDF's publication is called Solutions, but this is the real Solutions magazine. <laughs> and uh, in the current issue is a description of the Oberlin Project. Uh, and let me just end with a personal note. Uh, in 2008, I was living in London, and I wrote uh, a book called Down to the Wire, uh, Confronting Climate Collapse. And that was a meditation of 35,000 feet. Now, what's it like for us to live in this era? I've got four grandkids, and uh, so that, that caused me or helped me to meditate a bit about what it means for us to live in this particular era. And then uh, I worked for a foundation on the side, and we put in a fair amount of money to start what was called the President's Climate Action Plan. And we pulled together about 250 scientists and climate policy experts, and this is back in 2008. We met with all the candidates running for the White House in that year, except Fred Thompson. He didn't want to meet with us because he didn't think it was an issue. Uh, but we, we crafted a document about that thick, uh, aimed at the first 100 days of the next administration. Uh, of course, 2009 came and went. There was no climate policy uh, for all the reasons that have been discussed here, and uh, many of you know much more about this than, uh, than I do, but it didn't happen. We've stayed at that, and, and uh, there was a second edition of the Climate Action Plan that actually has had some traction. But for me personally, what, what do I do? I live in a small town, about 10,000 people, dead center of the U.S. Rust Belt. So if you think of Lake Erie, think of a map of Lake Erie. It's right here. Detroit's up here, and Toledo's here, and Cleveland's here. Oberlin is right there, 35 miles west of Cleveland. That was the heart of the U.S. economy. Youngstown, Ohio, which is at the extreme end of that, <laughs> close to where I grew up, in 1940, Youngstown is said to have had the highest per capita income of any city in the United States. Youngstown now looks like an invading German army went through there in 1943 and wiped it out and nothing's happened since. The town that I knew as a kid growing up is basically a ghost town. So what do we do? Well, we organized an effort. And again, this is one of those Lewis Mumford's withdrawal uh, uh, from the system kind of efforts. We organized an effort uh, jointly between the city of Oberlin and Oberlin College. And so we want to do five things. We want to rebuild a local economy. And the college would use its uh, buying power, investing power, and so forth to help drive that process. Number two, we want to do this in a way that becomes carbon neutral, but also in the process builds an economy. So we're one of the Clinton Climate Initiative sites uh, around the world. Uh, we're one of four that's reached participant status. We're, we've been rolled into the C40 cities. Uh, so you have the C40 cities, Beijing, and all these big cities up here. There's a little asterisk down here, a little pinprick, and that's Oberlin, Ohio, city of 10,000. But we are, as of last year, about 90% carbon-free uh, electric system. We're a municipally owned utility. And number three, we want to grow most of our food locally. So we won't import, uh, with climate change coming at us, we can't import uh, the food and the volume we need at a price we could afford from California. We've got to begin to reshape the supply lines. Uh, Ohio was a state that had a quarter million farms uh, 50 years ago. Now we're down to about 65,000 farms, mostly in corn and soybean business. Uh, and then fourth, we want to do this as a, an educational venture. We talk a good bit about ending silos in education, <coughs> interdisciplinary education. We want also to end the silos between different kinds of educational institutions. So we're, we've joined a Votech school, a two-year college, the Oberlin College and Public Schools into a consortium asking what do young people need to know to live in this era? What kind of skills and character traits and analytic abilities do they need to prosper and do well and help us move this world in a very different direction? And then there was a fifth goal. If we did this, made this little bubble of Oberlin uh, sustainable, uh, what would that amount to? And the, the honest answer is not much. It's only if we take these things to scale. And so the next effort builds on efforts that Gar's been involved in in Cleveland uh, called the Evergreen Foundation. Can we take this up to scale? Can we take this idea of full spectrum or system sustainability, where the parts interact together in a way that the whole is more than just the sum of the parts? Can we take that to scale around the Lake Erie Crescent? Can we begin to impact the Rust Belt? It starts at Flint, Michigan, where the mayor told me that their tax base falls 20% per year. That's a city in free fall. Detroit, you've read about. Toledo is not a whole lot better, but somewhat better. 
And then there's Cleveland, which has come back a long ways, but has a long way to go. Then there's Youngstown, Ohio. So could we take that region and begin to apply these same ideas that we're doing in this little tiny bench lab experiment of Oberlin? Take that up to the regional scale. And the plan is, and we'll see how this works out, uh, you know, so stay tuned. But the plan is to harness the buying and investment power of the major educational institutions in that region and a couple of foundations and redirect that money to smart growth or urban renewal, sustainable agriculture and renewable energy. And do that in a way that the benefits spill out into other areas. And then there's nothing new in this. Jane Jacobs said the same thing in her writings years ago. It's called import substitution, but now apply to a regional scale, not just to a city region, as she described it. Can we begin to think through our problems that have to do with ownership and with distribution and fairness? Can we start the process of withdrawal and rebuilding? And that builds on the work of many of you in this room uh, many not in this room, but this is the revolution that's underway. This is in every way a governance issue, but we'll have to begin this from the very bottom up. So uh, let me end with that. I think uh, we're going to make it, but this is going to be a close call. We don't have any reason for uh, complacency. When Danella Meadows, a great Danella Meadows, uh, who died about 10 or 11 years ago, was asked, is there enough time to make the transition? She said, there's only one answer you can give. She said, of course there's enough time, but just enough time. So thanks to you for all the work you do. Thanks, Tom, for organizing this. Uh, thanks, uh, Ed and Bob, for uh, the leadership at the uh, World Watch Institute. It's great to spend some time with you. Thank you.